Hey y'all, and welcome to MT's Corner with Maisha Tierra. And I'm Maisha Tierra, professional actress, director, theater owner, and content creator. On my channel, we discuss all things acting, centered around the black acting experience. From my opinion, to movie reviews, to acting advice, and much more, you'll find right here. So, join your girl in the corner. We have some things we need to discuss. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe so you can see me on your timeline every time. Y'all. Did you hear about this foolishness? I mean, can a black actor catch a break or what? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the show Heroes. I haven't watched Heroes in years. And funny thing is, I actually stopped watching it because Leonard Roberts' character, D.L. Hawkins, died off the show. But before I get into that, for those that don't know, Heroes is an American superhero drama television series created by Tim Cream that appeared on NBC for four seasons from September 25th, 2006 to February 8th, 2010. The series tells the stories of ordinary people who discover that they have superhuman abilities and how these abilities take effect in their characters' lives as they work together to prevent catastrophic futures. Now that that's out of the way, let's get back to why I watched it. Three actors kept me coming back for more, and that was Hayden Panettiere, Leonard Roberts, and Noah Gray Cabby, who played Leonard's son in the series. I rooted even harder for Leonard because of Drumline. Yes, Drumline. If you haven't watched that film, you are missing out on some serious black culture, okay? He was a band leader who took no shit from anyone, and I knew he was going to kill it on Heroes. Then one day, his character just dies, which is real odd since he has the power to phase through objects and allow them to phase through him. Okay, let's rewind a little backstory on who he was before he received his superpowers and how they came about. So, six months prior to most of the series event, DL, aka Leonard, was a construction worker. He and his wife, Nikki, aka Allie Larder, were having financial troubles and construction didn't pay very well. At some point, DL began leading a group of criminals. Yeah, I know. He's black and magic a gang member. What else is new for black male actors, especially the dark skinned ones? Anywho, ultimately, he left the gang before they stole two million dollars and killed a security guard. But the gang planted the murder weapon at his house, leading him to being arrested for the crime. Frustrated by the police and his general situation, he discovered he possessed the ability to phase through solid matter during his initial interrogation with law enforcement. Okay, my boy was trying to get out of those shackles. Okay, black lives matter, hun. So, because he could phase through matter, he slipped through his cuffs. DL used his powers to escape prison in hopes of clearing his name and protecting his family, okay? I was rooting for his character so hard, y'all. And once he died, I kind of fell off Heroes real talk. It just wasn't for me anymore. And lo and behold, this week, I found out about all the BS he had to put up with on that toxic set. He told Variety that he experienced immediate friction with his main co-star, Ali Larder, who played his wife, and indifference from creator and showrunner Tim Crean that led him to feel singled out as a black actor, a feeling that only grew more intense after he was fired from the show after its first season. And Variety corroborated Leonard's account with 10, you heard me right, 10 people who either worked on Heroes at the time or were familiar with his experience on the show. So honey, it definitely isn't all in his head. Initially, Allie Lauder did not provide any comment. I'm sure she asked her PR what to do with it. While Crean and executive producer Dennis Hammer both praised Roberts and most importantly did not dispute his account initially that is. What made him even bring this back up was when he was walking his dogs two months into the pandemic his daughter asked why people had their windows boarded up and it made him reflect on his experience on the set of Heroes. He said I've been a black actor for 25 years but I've been a black man in America my whole life. Those are never separate journeys nor do I believe they ever should be. The Black Lives Matter protests clearly were bringing up feelings of anger, fear, and shame continue to connect my professional past I now believe is deserving of reflection and public airing. In 2006, I was fortunate enough to land a role on NBC's television series Heroes. I played D.L. Hawkins, who in the early draft of the pilot was literally described as a white man's nightmare. And if you think I'm kidding, look at this.
Now, if you think that's shocking, you'd be surprised to see some of the racist character breakdowns I received myself in the past. Leonard went on to say, through the entire audition process, I found a connection to the character that didn't traffic in stereotypes. And when I got the job, it was my first series regular on network television. After the show was picked up to series, I learned my character had been removed from the pilot and would be introduced in the second episode. I briefly wondered if black folk in the TV game suffered the same fate as our counterparts in pre-Jordan Peele horror films and were the first to go upon a new show's pickup. As production began, I looked forward to sharing my thoughts on my character with the writing staff as I heard other cast members had done the same with theirs. Unfortunately, no such meeting ever materialized. Then I learned that despite the show's three black series regulars, there were no black writers on staff. After a particular odd promotional photo shoot in which all the black adult series regulars were regulated to the back and the sides of photo after photo because we were told we were tall, I was approached by Tim Crean, the creator of the show. He told me my character would not be introduced in the second episode, but that great ideas were on the way. I sat on the sidelines for the second, third, fourth, and fifth episode. Finally, I was excited to learn that episode six would mark my debut. The script suggested DL and Nikki had a volatile relationship, and it wasn't long before the art was imitating life, with me on the receiving end of pushback from my co-star regarding the playing of a particular tip scene. Coming from theater, I was familiar with passions running high in the process Process of bringing characters to life. So I later gave her a bottle of wine with a note affirming what I believe to be mutual respect and a shared commitment to doing exceptional work. Neither the gift nor the note were ever acknowledged. Like yes, theater gives. Like that's what we theater people do. I personally remember giving a theater opening night gift of throat coat, a mug, and among other goodies to an actress that I was understudying at an equity theater house. And she snared at me y'all dead a, literally, and asked me why would I give her something. Mind you, you. I think she was a TV or film actor who did theater sometimes, so she doesn't understand our traditions. I didn't even say anything to the bitter lady besides it's theater tradition and just walked off. Looking back, I would have rather Leonard's interaction with his co-star because at least she was honest in that moment of not acknowledging his gift at all, which equals pretty much to, I don't F with you. Now on another occasion, he says, during the staging of a bedroom scene, my co-star took issue with the level of intimacy being suggested between our characters. In a private rehearsal, Greg Beeman, our director, asked if she was willing to lower the straps of the top she was wearing and expose her bare shoulders only above the sheet that covered her in order to give the visual impression she was in the same state of undress as me as I was shirtless. My co-star refused Beeman's request and I was instantly aware of the tension on set. I remember instinctively checking to make sure both my hands were visible to everyone who was there as not to have any intentions or actions misconstrued. Despite Beeman's clear description of what he was looking for visually, my co-star instead insisted she was indeed being asked to remove her top completely and rehearsal was cut. She then demanded a meeting with Beeman and the producers who were on set and proceeded to have an intense and loud conversation in which she expressed she had never been so disrespected as an actress, a woman, or a human being. Later, she found me and said she'd hoped the discussion could stay between us. I didn't know how that was possible given said discussion was had at an elevated level on a soundstage and front of the crew. Also, my co-star never once thought to include me, her scene partner, and part of a discussion in which I would have gladly participated. So, I found the appeal to be my sense of solidarity after the fact strange and somewhat hollow. Nonetheless, I assured her I was fine with getting the work done in any way she and Beeman could agree on. We completed the scene with the straps of my co-star's top clearly visible, resolving the matter which I believe was her satisfaction. While that was my first episode, my co-star had been working on Heroes for over a month and she shot another scene that called for a Nikki to seduce Nathan Petrelli, played by Adrian Pazdar. After watching the episode, I asked Pazdar if there had been any concerns similar to what I had witnessed during my episode. He replied to the contrary and mentioned her openness to collaborate and even improvisation. I pondered why my co-star had exorbitantly played a different scene with Petrelli character involving overt sexuality while wearing lingerie but found aspects of one involving love and intimacy expressed through dialogue with my character, her husband, disrespectful to her core. I couldn't help wondering whether race was a factor. In December 2006, I had a meeting with the executive producer, Dennis Hammer, who wanted to address a post by Michael Ocello from TV Guide. Any, many, miny heroes. If other huge TV hits have taught us anything, 
it's that great success begets huge ego clashes. So it should come as no surprise that on-screen tensions within one of the hero's main couples has slipped over into real life. According to multiple unnamed sources who ask not to be identified for fear of having their brains devoured, the female half of the twosome cannot stand to be in the same room as her leading man, let alone make out with him. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, these two have shared only a handful of scenes together in recent weeks. Send me your guesses and I promise I won't confirm if you're correct. I like my brains without teeth marks too. First of all, whoever wrote that article thought they were real cute, didn't they, with that cringy ass paragraph. Anywho, Leonard said, Hammer told me not to worry as the matter was being handled internally and to continue being the professional I had proven myself to be. As the first season played out, I learned to other non-white lead actors, characters would be killed off and I started to wonder whether DL would suffer the same fate. His presence on the show kept getting smaller and by the mid season finale, he'd been shot more times than Tupac. I even had my management inquire about the possibility of me being killed off. While I was initially thankful for the opportunity, the experience had become creatively unfulfilling and I thought moving on might be best for everyone. I was told, however, that the production response was, we love Lynn. And in March 2007, while filming the penultimate episode of the season, a producer told me that I was indeed returning for season two. I took it as a positive sign and look forward to new possibilities. One of our last publicity obligations, the first season involved a photo shoot for Entertainment Weekly, in which cast members, based on their character's relationship on the show, were featured on collector's edition covers. The release of the covers was to coincide with the network's upfront presentation for the 2007-2008 season in New York. Upon arriving backstage at Radio City Music Hall for rehearsal, I caught my co-star's eye. I'm hearing our cover is selling the least of all of them, she told me. It was the first and only thing she said to me that night, and I believe the subtext was clear. I was tarnishing her brand. The day after returning from upfront, I received a call from Green, my first ever. In a short voice message, he said that due to Allie Lauder's situation, when the show returned for season two, audiences would learn that DL had died, that I was free to call him if I wanted to talk. I was stunned. I decided to take Cringe up on his offer and set an appointment with him. When I arrived at his office, I was surprised to see that Dennis Hammer was there as well. Green began by reiterating that because of my co-star, he just couldn't make my remaining on the show work story-wise. Green said he felt my character had been and paint it into a corner due to the fact that we didn't have chemistry and that an attempt to create a new storyline for DL just felt like the tail wagging the dog. I replied that I found it interesting that he created a world where people flew, painted the future, bent time and space, read minds, erased minds, and were indestructible, yet somehow the potential story solution of my character getting divorced left him utterly confounded. I also questioned how a we issue could be cited as justification for firing of me. Hammer stepped in. He said that he needed me to know I was loved and my co-star was hated by many for her behavior, saying it as if I would join in. I did. I just wanted to be able to do my job and do it well. Hammer then made it clear he would deny what he said if I went public with said revelation. I point out it was absurd to hear that given that when the meeting concluded, my co-star would be the one still with a job and I would be the one painfully unemployed. Hammer said I needn't worry, suggesting I would undoubtedly move on from heroes and still be working in 10 years. Don't think of this situation where the black man loses and the white woman wins, Hammer said. And that was the first time my race was ever acknowledged while I was a part of the show. Not for any creative contribution I could make, but for what I believed was the fear of me becoming litigious. Weeks later, an olive branch was offered. The network was sending the Heroes cast on a promotional world tour to capitalize on the show's global success, and Kring made the point of telling me over voicemail that he would personally see to it and my co-star and I would be on different legs of the tour. He also made it clear that my participation in the tour as well as a promotional photo shoot for season two were necessary to not give away the fact that DL was deader than fried chicken. Through my representatives, I passed with a respectful and expletive-free decline, as my priority was finding another job. The fall of 2007, I received two scripts that concluded DL's storyline. This death was to be the result of a random act of gun violence. I found the choice to be as perplexing as it was ironic, given DL's ability to pass through matter. Apparently, bullets were still an exception. What was most offensive was the offer to pay me as a guest star instead of a series regular. I was prepared to walk away, but my representative 
representatives were able to secure pay consistent with what I had made as a series regular as a gesture of making me whole. D.L. Hawkins death was saved from my last day of filming and involved me throwing my body off camera just as an assailant raised a gun and fired. The shot ended not with me but with Nikki's face alone in the frame splattered with D.L.'s blood. It took one take. Nailed it. What a pro the director said. That's lunch the AD said. My co-star gave me a goodbye embrace the most we had ever touched on or off camera and everyone left. As I walked to my car, Dennis Hammer's words echoed in my head. He was right, there was no doubt what I meant to the family. I drove home in complete silence to constantly feel I had to prove not only the validity but the very existence of racism before I could even own my feelings about it only added to my frustration. Weeks after my last Heroes episode, one of the castmates with no irony said, can you really say you lost your job because you're black? Come on man, they're gonna always keep the hot blonde on the show. That's just how Hollywood. I responded that for him as a white man to ask me to deny I lost my job because I was black but except my co-star kept her job because of attributes he clearly believed identified her as white was in fact quite literally the embodiment of systematic racism. In the years after my time on Heroes, the burden of carrying the secret of my experience had a profoundly negative effect on how I interacted with the world. Professionally, I struggled with the internalization of anger and defeat unlike any I'd ever experienced in my career. Realizing I had no agency to demand anything from a work environment which I was expected to perform left me incensed. Knowing that every other future work endeavor could potentially turn out the same way left me exhausted. Personally, carrying the burden led me to withdraw from colleagues, friends, and loved ones due to my belief that I was a failure for not being able to somehow just be better and rise above it all. My voice felt muted and my light dimmed. It would be 10 years before I would become a series regular again. One of the main reasons he spoke out, he said, I know I have the most personal stake in seeing the true and lasting systematic change become a reality. During Heroes, I focused on the fact that D.L. was a father who above all else loved his child. Now I'm a father to a child who at too tender an age struggles with her own heartbreaking understanding of what it means to be a black girl in this world. Nightmares become routine, often revolving around the same fear that her blackness will be the death of her. For black people aren't safe anywhere, not even in their own homes. Like every black parent, I live in the pain of knowing I cannot shield her from the world that exists and struggle with the sobering thought of when and how to take her innocence away. Although I want her to be fully aware of what the world is, I also want her to live the promise of what can be. But before I can raise her to live in her complete truth, I have to do the same. You can read the rest of this article in a link in the description. Y'all, after reading about his experience, all I can say is I relate. I know how hard it is to do your job as an actor in spite of racist breakdowns. Co-workers who see you as less than and directors and writers who don't ask your input on your character. You go to work feeling alone. You go to work feeling defeated before your day has even started good. I'm extremely grateful that he has spoken out about his experience because not only do black actors need to hear this and know they are not alone, the people who made the situation toxic need to receive the backlash. You can't treat someone as less than because of their race. At times, I think waking up as a black person, I'm in the damn 1960s. Why must I suffer so much trauma for you to feel comfortable in a world that my people have helped build after being stolen from our homelands? Why? Those of you that claim to be allies, where was someone to speak up for Leonard on set? Where was his protection? They had had no problem protecting a skinny white blonde haired woman who seemed to have caused all of the problems but instead of firing the problem you fire the person who doesn't give you an issue that my friends in this case is called racism to not even have a black writer to help flush out his character arc and to not even ask him to help flush out his character arc when all the other co-stars receive this opportunity is racist for his white male co-star who thought it was funny to joke about the situation and not to see the severity of it is in fact dismissive and stems from unconscious bias and systematic racism. You are also a part of the problem, sir. Like Leonard says, the studio can't spend millions to support black causes publicly, but have no black people in leadership roles. The white show creator can't create a show featuring non-white on-camera talent, but disregarding non-white voices behind the scenes. The white actor who worked for half as long as a comparable actor of color, yet makes twice as much, has to be willing to put that on the line to give a voice to the disparity in the name of fairness and equity. As artists 
as professionals and as human beings. Fully embracing this moment should not only result in our existence, but thriving. And because people love receipts, and like to say things didn't happen, Variety covered their tracks, okay? They contacted everyone mentioned by name with detailed summary of how they're described in Robert's essay. When asked via email about the specific day on set, Robert's described as prompting an intense and loud conversation between Allie Lauder and director Greg Beeman. Beeman replied, I don't remember a loud argument or her saying anything about being disrespected. We worked out her character's intention regarding the wardrobe and shortly returned to work and finished the show. A representative for Adrian Pazdar did not respond to multiple attempts to reach him for comment. Hmm. Tim Kring provided this statement. In 2006, I set out to cast the most diverse show on television. Diversity and connectivity and inclusivity were groundbreaking hallmarks of heroes. So too was a huge diverse cast that continually rotated off and onto the show with none ever being written off based on their race. Looking back now, 14 years later, given the very different lens that I view the world through today, I acknowledge the lack of diversity at the upper levels of the staff may have contributed to Leonard experiencing the lack of sensitivity that he described. I have been committed to improving upon this issue with every project I pursue. I remember Leonard fondly and wish him well. Dennis Hammer provided this statement. 14 years ago is a long time, but I remember clearly that Leonard was a great guy and a total pro. Despite off-the-record communication with a representative for Lauder, the actor did not provide any on-the-record response to Variety. Several hours after this publication, Lauder provided the statement to TV Line. I am deeply saddened to hear about Leonard Roberts' experience on Heroes, and I'm heartbroken reading his perception of our relationship, which absolutely doesn't match my memory nor experience on the show. I respect Leonard as an artist, and I applaud him or anyone using their voice and platform. I'm truly sorry for any role I may have played in his painful experience during that time and I wish him and his family the very best. Despite at least 10 people corroborating the story Leonard told, the major players in his discomfort honestly dismissed his experience as if he dreamt it. I don't know what that means for the rest of us black actors, but as we grow and learn, I'm rooting for y'all. And I understand when you don't speak out right away when you are mistreated on set because it is clear that oftentimes you have to be your own ally and that's no way to live. Let me know down below your thoughts on this whole situation. Let's get into it. Y'all stay safe out there and I'll see you online next time.